I am unashamed. What about you? Now I got. I'm putting my Bible back together. This is a just a disaster. I think I got it now. Y'all notice you? You got a. That's when I start looking for another one when I get to well, that. Well, I think you're there. Yeah. Complicated, Phil. It's complicated. It's the bottom line is when you're when you're having to re-piece your Bible back into its original format, it may be time for a new Bible. I mean, well, I'm a man of history. Uh, <laughs> me and this Bible have been through a lot together. It's painful, though, yeah. for us to watch it just literally fall apart every In my experience, well, three to five years, and I'm looking for another Bible, that, but, I, but well, I really hate to change because I got all of my pertinent well, points. Yeah, y'all With gonna that have logic, to... then both of your wives should, should have left y'all because I'm looking at y'all, and y'all are literally falling apart. <laughs> Mine I mean, how? He can't even. He can't Mine even grab. Probably He's been uh, tempted. Uh, 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 probably crossed something's mind. I might. So dumb. You know, now you it. see it in person in all its glory. So I decided to use my finger. Jay says my lead in yesterday on my sermon. Oh, well, I heard it. Like, I listened. But I told you you should have went with my idea. If you would have, if you would have gone Rucker, who brought up the Windex bottle and said, "You ever tried Windex?" and which I thought was a bold illustration. He actually had Gatorade instead of Windex. Yeah. I bought into uh, it. He he got me. I, if you would have quoted the verse that says, "If your right hand causes you to the sin, sin, cut it off," so you should have said the middle finger and what it represents. I'm going to do today. We're going to remove that. <laughs> Not that you and, would have removed it. Just right. That would have been the uncomfortable moment. Right. Nobody would have been. And like, you could have said, "Mike, you're a doctor." <laughs> Now, <laughs> which is I'll bring a, Dr. Phil up there. If it, Phil, you Phil. could perform no. one of your notorious surgeries on him. Well, that's right. You should have had Phil remove it because he's famous for his surgical procedures. Or well, like, I actually, well, I actually asked the question. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, and maybe I am thinking this way. But if it doesn't, because there's a fifty-fifty chance it's going to be right when they take this off. Seven weeks, this has to stay on here, and so it's straightened out. The plan is if the tendon grows to the bone. So what happens yep. is. When your when your tendons tear in the last knuckle, there's nothing to reattach it to because it yeah, ends. That's why I'm telling yeah. you, I just cut it off. Well, I thought I about that. I, I was like, I, ha- I haven't talked to the doctor yet, but what happens if it doesn't work? Because it's just an appendage, just a piece that won't work. If you cut it off at the knuckle, then the, then this finger would still work three quarters. I see three quarter p- finger people all the time. Wow, I was going to tell you. So time. look, I, y'all know I play cards, and and Phil keeps calling it gambling, but it's not gambling <laughs> if, if you're going to win. So yeah, I did a wedding and met one of your people that's at your yeah. tables. Well, this last week he seemed like he he's he, he does a, he seemed like he does lose a little from our conversation. He was a little low on. <laughs> I think well, I think he may be gambling. Jay. I don't even know, but <laughs> you don't know which what one I'm it saying was, is. But. There's a guy who uh, there's one guy we play with that the first time we played together, because you when somebody sits down you form an opinion of them. Well, I looked down and I noticed that he was missing his index finger. Okay, so I immediately didn't didn't trust him because if you're you know if you're playing cards with a guy that only has nine fingers i'm wondering did he lose that finger over some activity (laughs) involving (laughs) yeah involving this game i would be much more concerned if one of them had 11 fingers jays because they might have an extra finger i mean if he if he was dealing from the bottom of the left (laughs) deck i could see Matt and, Dillon and, run upon a many a person like you, Jace. He did not like gamblers. He he just didn't like them. Yeah. He said they yeah. trouble follows them yeah. everywhere they go. I'm not a gambler. So anyway, look, Al, so you could represent something. I'm trying to introduce a philosophy here that you're not buying into. But if if you saw a preacher of the word who was missing his middle finger, the opposite would the opposite connotation would attach to that. I would tend to trust a guy <laughs> like that, especially when you have a verse that says, Hey, you know what? Just so I'm never tempted to do that at another person Whack in traffic, out. I'm just gonna remove this. Yeah. <laughs> well I had a guy out at camp who's a good friend his name is Raj Bundy. He's out in Lubbock, Texas, and he's missing his middle finger. I think it's his middle it's one of them. And I thought the same thing. You, he could never flip anybody off if you didn't have no. the middle finger. Look, I'm Problem was have... yesterday I was holding the microphone, Jace. Look, mm-hmm. and I can't bend this finger. 
And so I typically hold it in my right hand. So when I was speaking, it was like I couldn't make this finger go down. See what I'm saying? Yeah, that ain't cut good. it off. <laughs> I'm only kidding because now I have to clarify when I'm joking or because uh, <laughs> or you're gonna get or Zach's gonna get letters. No, it's not <laughs> letters. I've got I got two confrontations at the gas station over things that I've said during the podcast. <laughs> And, uh, but this is about you and gas stations, Jason. He's got a long history. People just, That's a volatile place for you. Because they're, they're listening to the podcast driving down the road, and then they look up and say, hey, there's a guy I'm listening to. They pull in there. <laughs> so the first question, do you want to hear these questions? You want to do this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Well, the first question was, the guy says, uh, he says, so, you, so you're saying the kingdom is in reference to Daniel too and he and he he was familiar with the Daniel too where the Medo Persians yeah. the Greek, yeah, which we've talked about several yeah. times. And he said, I got a question for you. He said, What about China? And I kind of looked around behind me because I was kidding and I was trying to gather my thoughts on how to respond to this. They didn't become he, an empire till nineteen seventy something. Well if I would have had a greater uh, historical not <laughs> historical we made I, china an empire and then the, he he killed millions in about the 70s to get him get them all lined out and burned every bible well, he here's what find. i said i said well, what's your point my old say tongue and, and he said well there's no mention of china or japan back there and they were you know they were here and i said well i don't know what y'all would have said but i said you got to remember that when we're talking about the kingdom being revealed, which I thought this was, we're in Mark, I think this applies, is when he said the kingdom is near, and he's referencing himself as the son of man, going back to Daniel, he, God chose Israel to be his chosen nation and to work within that nation to bring eventually bring about Jesus. Which yep. is why well, it ends with Rome. Which is why that, that's what I said. Yeah. And so I said, so he didn't, the Bible is not a detailed analysis of every country and every historical act that's ever happened in, in the world. It, it was just showing you the picture of how God, his scheme of redemption, which to my surprise, he said, well, yeah, I, okay. So they didn't have it. it they, he didn't it mention actually, other nations or other powers. Actually, that Jace, his question proves our point that's right that it the it, it, the the idea of the empires ends when the kingdom comes in because then it doesn't matter anymore what well, about that, us that's what about basically the what i said i yeah. said you're gonna find yourself getting to matthew 28 when he said oh jesus now that he's here i said we're in mark now and he he's, has all the authority and power yeah more than all the empires who ever came before him well here was the problem i said well we're in mark now you just heard he's like well, no, I'm on episode, you know, 214 or something. I was like, <laughs> we just tell him, okay. you're, in about a year, we can have this conversation. I said, let's, ha let's do a rule from here on out. Once you catch up, <laughs> the next time you see me at a gas station, pull in and we'll chat. Because yeah. <laughs> within the future, just 300 podcasts have transpired since that where he's at listed. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, other, not to, oh, go ahead. Well, let me just say that. Not, yeah, not, not, and not to get too deep into uh, what is termed as uh, our eschatological view of the book of Revelation. Zach, don't be using words. Zach, nobody using, knows. There's, there's, there's the complaint like, against Zach. I'm he going to say like, that. Never You've found got that to word define. in the Bible. Eschatology. I never saw that. Zach, well, let's define Zach that. Zach juxtaposed the yeah. eschatology. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's let's define that before well, you continue. <laughs> This, the end times, like what, like what's the what's the end times going to look like, and, and and what does it all mean? And uh, um, our position, you know, we we and this is controversial, so don't get mad, you know. But you know, I think all four of us agree, like we we don't subscribe to the you know the rapture or uh, the whole millennial reign and all that. Uh, and so, but but those who do would interpret Daniel seven, the, they would probably say China's oh, one of the the beasts in there. So they're so they're looking at it. As this is a lot of this is yet to unfold. Right. The position that we're coming at this from is that that this is a, a prophecy that's already occurred. It was a, not when it was written; it hadn't occurred yet, but it was going to occur, and then was accomplished in the the Book of Revelation primarily, like as this idea of the fall of the Roman Empire, the, you get the burning of the temple in AD seventy. So we're looking at kind of this whole thing as 
as a lot, a lot of, not all of it, but a lot of it has already occurred, um, which is, the, that's the, but that's the debate. And, you know, I mean, I told someone the other day, like, well, it's, you can't, I mean, look, it's, it's complicated. I, we're not hanging our hat on this. This is no. not like, hey, this we, is what, the, you know. Jace, well, and Jace when you said, didn't wear a shirt, but, it, it, you know, we could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, well, my, my other, <laughs> my other uh, person that asked the question, which he was not as friendly about it, uh, <laughs> he said, he just rolled down his window as he's driving by and said, baptism has nothing to do with water. You're preaching the Bible incorrectly. And I said, Jesus is Lord. I mean, I, I didn't know what, what. This is a drive-by hollering. It was the first time I've had a drive-by <laughs> rain well, of spiritual. You don't have to do something yeah. the first time you ever hear of any kind of anything well, about baptism. Right. It's associated with water. And he said it had the guy with that water. brought it on was John the Baptist. And he was wanted, going to the Jordan River. I well, he's water. not here. He's driving in a truck somewhere. <laughs> but he seemed angry. And, uh, it looked like he had had it on his chest. I did, I did want to say something to uh, Zach, what he said. Now, I do believe in the rapture if you're talking about 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, yeah. the, if, if the, cause the word rapture is not in the Bible. No. I, eschatology, I just looked it up. It does mean end time. I'd never heard that phrase. It's not in the Bible either, I don't believe. No. no. I, I don't remember that. But uh, but you were right, is that you're smarter. But I will say, so because I asked a guy one time, I think you're talking about a lot of people believe that the kingdom, some people believe, will be established at a later time from right now, and there will be these, this war and, like, post-rapture, these things are going to occur. I believe that we will be you know, caught up in the air. If you mean rapture, caught up together in the air with Jesus, and we, however you want to phrase that, leave together to be a part of God's forever family. Well, I do believe in that. Yeah, and and most of the, most of them think there's a, a thousand year period or some period in between, and mm-hmm. a lot of it's off the. But I mean, I, my take is I've always taken Revelation as being it's an apocalyptic book, but it's written specifically to a group of people, and I think he lays it out pretty clearly in the first three chapters that it's aimed at these seven churches, and the idea is you got to hold on through this what's coming because we're going to win the situation, win the war. And they did. But, and they did. But most so. people believe in the religious world. I think we should unite on whether you believe there's going to be a thousand year period in between, or we just all go up together. I don't think I've ever met someone that believes this is some kind of salvation issue or, you know, how, but you know, it's interesting. Out. That's a great point, Jay's because I was thinking about that looking when studying back through our text again. And I think, you know, it almost looks like, because it seems like it's a little bit almost unfair that Jesus is being more specific with these parables in, in Mark 4 with his disciples than with the larger crowd. But I think it speaks to what we're talking about here today on the podcast. For believers, we can argue about eschatology or, you know, debate, I should say, not argue. We, we can talk about baptism and its application, but that's inside. When we're speaking to people that don't know Jesus, we have to stay focused there, whether we have different on the inside. And I think he's showing that. There is an inside and an outside, because when he's telling he's telling these parables, his time hasn't come yet, so he's putting it out there to see who's serious about wanting to follow. He's checking the soil. Exactly. Well, our whole last podcast was talking about the critical ideal that you need to, in how you listen and being open-minded. Right. And so, look, I listen to speakers all the time that I don't agree with a lot of what they say. And it, I mean, that's okay. Yeah. Because they say a lot of good things. That's right. You know, now I'm not going to listen to somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus is the son of God or is Lord or, no. Right. You know, I, I draw the line there. But this kind of stuff, it doesn't bother me at all. But I think a lot of people in in religion or church, if they hear one thing that they don't agree with, it's a stop eject moment That's right. it's a roll <laughs> down your window as you pass one by it was a <laughs> drive-by hailing of of words you know that was not I, you know i don't know how do you respond to that wait well, it's hard to right, well, I think hang, on, hang, on, that, hang on that let's take our first break so one of our uh, long-standing um 
sponsors is a group called Patriot Mobile, and we appreciate their support on the podcast. Uh, They are America's only Christian conservative mobile phone provider, and they're much a force in conservative values. They believe, like most of us do that listen to this podcast, uh, they basically take a portion of your bill and they fund conservative causes and candidates uh, who believe in sanctity of life, freedom of speech, the Second Amendment. Uh, and these are ideas that are winning across America. So it's no you know, small feat that they're a part of that for all of us. They have affordable plans for you and your family, even your business. They offer the same nationwide coverage as the major carriers because they use multiple major networks. Plus, you're, con- you're supporting conservative values with every call. So check them out, patriotmobile.com slash Phil. Or you can call them at 972-PATRIOT. You're going to get free activation with the offer code Phil. And they also have special discounts that are available for veterans and first responders. So join our movement. Make the switch today and a difference tomorrow. PatriotMobile.com slash Phil. That's PatriotMobile.com slash Phil. Or you can call them at 972-PATRIOT. Yeah, I think it's a it's a failure on our part because of the West our Western mentality and how we approach uh, spiritual transformation. You know, it's like we read the Bible as like almost just educationally, or it's like we're we're dividing it on its grammar and its syntax and all that. But 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 truly, I mean, you think about what what the Hebrew writer says that the, that the Bible that the Word it divides spirit and soul. It's living. It's breathing. And I, I think when we hang up on these things that we could be wrong on, and I always get really skeptical if you're super confident on something to the point where you're willing to divide the church over it, particularly on these secondary and tertiary issues like eschatology or your view of baptism or things like that. Like they, I'm not going to count someone as not a brother or not do fellowship with them because we have different opinions on these things. Or I, I'm. I think I'm right on everything I believe until I realize I'm not right on it anymore. And then, <laughs> you, right. I mean, but I, I, I mean, I've changed my views a lot. So there's, we got to have that humility moving into reading God's word and not reading it as simply a, a way to gain a bunch of information. Uh, because the truth is that information alone does not lead to transformation at home. Transformation comes from, from really soaking in the spirit of what is written in these texts uh, and, and what's being which, revealed, who is God spirit, himself. Yeah. Is a person, which is what we're, yeah. what we're focused on. That so, plus we can't forget that uh, when Mark started, in other words, he said this, I'll just give you five of them right quick. Well, before you do for everybody listening like me, syntax <laughs> is the, a set of rules for an analysis of, <laughs> of language, the branch of linguistics that deals with uh, so it's words and phrases to create well formed sentences. That's right. That's right. right. Well, I didn't know. That, that, you're that's you're right. are using words. I've you're, never you're even proving heard my of. point. If somebody walked in and said, "Hey, let me check your syntax," yeah. I'd say, "Let me tell you something." You got to remember. I got Zach, a gun. You, got a, you got a dictionary. On There's no that. argument. <laughs> There's no argument with what is projected right in front of us, Zach. I, there's no argument with one thing. Sorry, Phil, go. The time has come, Jesus talking, uh, the kingdom of God is near. I take him at his word. And listen to this. Repent and believe the good news. What we're saying is everything we're talking about, now that's one in the book of Mark. Well, that's a Mark, big one. I think that's a big one. That's why I'm giving it to you. (laughs) You say, whatever they say, we're bringing through these scriptures in the book of Mark, and we did it with Matthew, we did it in Hebrews. Everything we've talked about is good news. That's what the gospel is, good news. Because what Jesus did and So if someone's arguing about, well, y'all are saying this and that about the kingdom, I said, we're just simply saying what Mark said. It was near when he was preaching. And it's not bad news. You've got it as being bad news that the kingdom is near. We're looking at the kingdom being near as good news. Because of the king is yeah. what I'm saying. That's Mark one fifteen. Well, Mark 3, 4. There's a difference between good and evil. 3, 4. Jesus asked him, and it hits my point, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? I mean, he said, look, 
we're, we're talking about something that's good here, the, the beneficial to you, Sabbath or no Sabbath, any what what's 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 that for? To make make good distinguish between good and evil. You say, yeah, they were calling good evil, and you look at it and you say, well, that's two texts, uh, four eight, Mark four verse eight. Let's see what they say here. It's pretty interesting. I don't have it two or three more. Uh, yeah. Well, 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 what do you know? Other seed, the seed that really did good, there was something unique about it. The seed that produced righteousness, uh, other seed fell on good soil. You say, well, what was the problem with the first three? It wasn't good soil. Because they weren't open, they weren't. They weren't hearing, open. They, they, weren't they wouldn't. To but the you king. get down here, they, yeah. and somebody says, "Do what? Jesus did what? He's fixing to do what? All of it's good. The good news it's right there in front of you. It's Jesus, who He is, what He's done for the the world, and He says, uh, "It came up with you. You plant that kind of heart, you say. So you're saying the good news of Jesus is really good to you, and you say." Yeah, it's good. So look, that's uh, Mark 1, 15, Mark 3, verse 4, Mark 4, verse 8. And the other one is 8, 36, which is kind of unique. I just looked yep. up how Just many times ahead. Mark had talked. 836. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. Uh, if anyone will come to, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now watch. What good is it? What's going to be good about your rejection of Jesus dying for you, being buried and raised from the dead? In other words, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world? You could gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul. It's God telling you through Mark that Jesus will save you, give you eternal life, and you will live forever. And what good is it if you gain the whole world, but you miss that? Well, mm. so you just add all those up. That's why I gave a lesson yesterday on why be good and how to be good. You're, you're, you're fueled for being good. And I looked, look, I just picked out a little book. Most people don't realize this, but if you say, What's the one book in the Bible that says more about good than any other book in the Bible? What's the one? What's this? God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. This is Titus 1. Titus 1 verse 8. If you're an elder, you must be hospitable. One who, uh-oh, loves what is good. That's one. Number two. There's a bunch of people just roaming around inside claiming they're members of the kingdom or against it. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny it. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit, uh-oh, for doing anything good. That's two. What well, you need to teach the older women? That's chapter 2, verse 3. Teach the older women to be reverent the way they live, not to be slanders or drink too much wine, ladies, but to teach what is good. That's three. Number four, verse 7. And everything set them an example by doing what is good. Seriousness, soundness of speech cannot be condemned. Still talking about good. The next one, verse 14, 214, Titus. People that are his very own, that's us, the kingdom of God, eager to do what is good. That's five times in the book of Titus. Number six, chapter three, verse two, verse one. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities. You might not love them, but you got to love them. To be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, be peaceable, considerate. That's chapter 3. You look over here, uh, chapter 3, number 2, be careful to, to devote themselves, that's what you teach, in what is good. That's seven times in the book of Titus. Number 8, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order they may provide for their daily life. Here's my point. And here's the Apostle Paul's point to Titus. You can't go wrong if you just roam around on planet Earth and you believe that what Jesus did for us was good through and through 
and we are to be like him. And all you need to do is do good instead of evil, and you're on your way. That's the point. And that's the point of the book of Mark. <clears throat> well, that's a good point. Right, let's take a break. So, Dad, you're 76 now, um, and you've never taken a lot of meds, but you told me you had had some aches and pains, and I told you I had discovered something called Omega XL uh, that you started to take. Has it made a difference with your aches and pain? I have none. There you go. That makes I'd say that it works then. I don't know if you know this or not, but because of our relationship with Omega XL, we found out you have 360 joints that start at your neck and go to your feet which can provide a lot of opportunity for, as you would say, mischief when it comes to your joints. But what these, what these guys do is they help provide SPMs, which are natural in your body when you're younger, but as you grow older, you produce less of them, which is why you have so many aches and pains in your muscles and in your joints. So what they offer is a supplement that reduces infl inflammation and it rejuvenates your joints and muscles. So you can kind of move around like you were a little bit younger. Uh, we love it. It, it works. Uh, a lot of people have been helped by it. So you go to OmegaXL.com slash Phil. You're going to buy one bottle. You get a second bottle for free. So that's OmegaXL.com slash Phil. Or you can call them at 800-844-4888. That's 800-844-4888. Or go to OmegaXL.com slash Phil. Eight times in that little book. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Um, I thought about it. I read. I had to preach. I read something. You did preach it. Um, I thought about this. The point about the Kingdoms Act, and so I've been reading. I, I'm looking at several commentaries, but I've been reading Chuck Swindoll, who's one of my favorite uh, authors. He's just real practical and great stuff. Been teaching in Baptist Seminary for years, and I was reading uh, last night. When he, his thing here, Mark 4, he said, the question we must answer in light of these parables is this, has the kingdom of God come to earth? And his answer is, the answer is yes and no, which is different, you know, kind of than what we think, but but I'm trying to be fair to his argument. It, it's, you know, it's an interesting thought. It, uh, he says, uh, while Jesus brought his kingdom to earth and has been anointed king, he has not yet been crowned and his literal earthly visible kingdom has not yet been established. Huh. And he uses the illustration of David and Samuel, which I never thought about before, where David was anointed king when he was a boy. Remember, he was they brought him in. But his kingdom didn't get established until after Saul was dead. And so that's his Old Testament illustration hey, who, who, of the who idea. Is, who is this again? This is Chuck who Swindoll. Is Okay, yeah, I mean, but you know, I think about like uh, that. The first verse that pops in my mind is is that when Jesus was going to the crucifixion, and he said, "The time has come." Uh, um, what did he say? Uh, Glorify me with the with, with the with the glory that I have with you before the world began. And so there's this idea that at the at the crucifixion, and then the really the resurrection when Jesus is resurrected, there's this vindication. And there's this uh, restoration uh, happening there where now Jesus is king and he sits at the right hand of God and he mediates for us. And um, I think it has implications, you know, downstream how you view the kingdom, because, you know, if you think it's something that you're waiting to come, then eternal life then becomes like a prize that's in the future. It's like something that we're waiting for. That is, I mean, it's it's good news, but it's not the best news. The best news that I can tell you is that it's here now. It's available today, and I think that's what Jesus was getting at in, in John seventeen three, uh, which is in that same time period of when he's praying, when he's about to go to the cross. What does he say? He says, "Eternal life is this." Power. When he started in Mark one, he's introducing what you where you started. You know, the gospel of Jesus, and yep. he's he's going around saying the time has come. Yep, kingdom of God is near repent and believe the good news and i think people people miss that in that the next three chapters that we've been in he does all these miracles and so people are like they start pursuing the miracle instead of the in what he's sharing and preaching the good news he he is the object yeah we, we pursue jesus now if miracles come great but our pursuit is Jesus. But that's why what I wanted to get to, 
I mean, since we jumped ahead anyway, is when you read the passage in Mark 8 about for whoever, uh, 35, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his, his soul? Well, he goes on to say, or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And then nine one is what I wanted to get to. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here, now he's, he's speaking to his disciples, yeah, will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Well, how is it possible it didn't show up? Well, exactly. <laughs> but but my point is, he, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things he just said there. One is, we, you know, when you read all those verses about doing good, well, each individual human has a hard time doing good without Jesus. In, in fact, it's so hard a time correct. that it becomes impossible. You are correct. And so all this power you see and all this authority, which, you know, the reason we have a hard time is it with it is because we put our faith and trust in things other than Jesus. I mean, mainly ourself. But, I mean, to have an illustration about that, it's kind of like if you're, if you're trying to get something correct, you know, I do a lot of traveling, you do a lot of traveling. If, if you're constantly talking to mid-level employees, there's a frustration that happens here, which usually culminates with what, Al? I need to talk to the manager. <laughs> can, I need to talk to can, the supervisor. Can you kick me up the chair? And look, all of a sudden, when you have someone comes out with some power, what happens? Things start happening. And so when you look at that with with – Matthew, you know, twenty eight, all in th- all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. When you put That's your all faith the authority in trust, that there is. Well, when you go to the ultimate power and authority, well, guess what? Things start happening then. Yep. You start getting direction, clarity. I mean, there's a lot of benefits. You are correct. Putting your faith and trust in, in Christ. Well, eventually, when he gets to this chapter eight and he starts saying, "You got to." I mean, because all these good things are happening. People are being healed, diseases. We're going to read, you know, girls raised from the dead. Demons are being cast out. I mean, it's like, well, this is awesome. And then when he gets to something like Mark 8, and he's like, well, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. I mean, you start saying, well, wait a minute now. What what happened to all this? You're going to heal me. And now you're wanting to me to give my life up, which is the point is what he was preaching and sharing about the kingdom and this repentance and this transformation. He was laying this foundation that you're going to, you're going to surrender. You're going to have to die. And it's going to happen in your lifetime. Yeah. Before you die. But, and my power will move in. It's available. And so I think that's where this thing gets off the rails. Cause in between statements like this, You have all these glorious miracles, and people are like, well, I just need my miracle on earth, you know, right now, because the kingdom can't be here because it's too sinful and it's too adulterous, the the culture. But he just mentioned that. He's like, if anyone is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, well, let me tell you about this generation here now. It's still sinful and adulterous. Yep. The same thing's going on. The difference is the Spirit's been poured out. You, Jesus can be surrendered to by faith. You can receive God's power, be a spirit-filled person on earth, which makes you a part of the kingdom of heaven. You're representing heaven and Jesus here as he's representing us. And to me, that's the excitement that he was trying to to get at in here. Yep. And you need authority. Yeah, uh, you need that authority to be able to do that. Hang on, Zach, let's take a break. You know, I think what I think what happens is when um, and look, I'll just say that, like, th- this is all great discussion. And like, this is what I think, but I could be wrong. But but I do think that when you have a view of the kingdom as, as being here and we're not saying that it's here in its full fr- fruition, it's not like fully here. I mean, we'd all we would agree to that. There's still sin. Right. Yeah. It's um, not finished. So the kingdom. 
no, it's not finished, but like, there, but God did establish it. He did bring it. Uh, the kingdom is here. We are participating in the kingdom now, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. But and I think him, what happens is in him is no sin. It, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Exactly but he's just we're saying in. we're pre-resurrection here. That's right. That is part. The second of this. coming does do something. <laughs> yes, that makes it forever. It's, I mean, you're right. Yeah, all, we're still it's, anticipating. It's, it's all, yeah, it's already here, but not yet fully here. It's right. already, but not yet. And I think that's we can we hold that intention. But no eschatology if, needed, nor. Uh, uh, what was eschatology again? End times. Yeah, I don't even know what that means. I still <laughs> y'all y'all define it, and I still don't know what it means. It means the it. end of times when when Jesus comes back. It's a study of how that's going to happen. Why would they call it such a complex word? I mean, nobody knows. Well, what nobody could figure out what was going on. Because people <laughs> go to seminary. It's <laughs> far more simple than that. I mean, I don't get it. Let's talk about eschatology. Yeah. Well, that's what it's called, Jess. So I mean, we're talking about Jesus coming back. We're talking about the end of time. Well, why call it that? Why, 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 okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I just I don't, I don't like know. that I don't like I'll that give word. You answer. Okay. It's just the word. It's just okay, the word. Okay, Mr. That sums Syntax up a lot. Guru. <laughs> you said, well, you okay. find out about eschatology when you find out about uh, uh, what's the word they uh, what's the what's the mantra they use? Uh, rapture. You know, you'll find out about eschatology. So is when that you, when you find out where the rapture? Well, all the rapture. I'm like. Well, where's these verses? Where there's a, read that? There, well, well, there's be, a lot of I'm, debate about Revelation, Dad. Most of it comes from. But study I think of y'all are going too far. The, if I, well, as it was explained to me, all the word rapture means is caught up in the air. Right. Well, well, that yeah, is. Yeah, I think we're we're, we're we're talking about rapture, like uh, from like John Darby's interpretation, and the, the, I think the Schofield Bible made it very popular in the late late eighteen hundreds, I believe. Where's Darby? Before Mark or after Mark? Darby, Darby, <laughs> no. Well, that's my point. I mean, it's well, a relatively late. It's a relatively Matthew, late Mark, Darby uh, edition. And John. <laughs> well, but we but we do have to be fair and say that I we're like people are interpreting this. And we're we're sharing our interpretation right. other people have a different interpretation of it and and i know a lot well, of and people that's what, who hold jay uh Zach, that's what swindoll's ultimate point was is the kingdom's not fully established until every knee bows which we know happens when jesus comes back so which we would agree with that we would agree, we would with, agree that. with that's that. exactly right yeah. so it, that's I mean, that's not really looking at it like i have a position or i'm necessarily disagreeing i mean if somebody says well, we do think the kingdom is established and it's here that's well, what yeah. we believe that okay i just read it right. that it's gonna happen in their lifetime but i'm saying some of this stuff it's like some of these words people are using to describe this stuff i don't know if i agree with that like if like if uh, Zach would have just said, you know, do we have the same view on eschatology? I would have said, I'm not sure, because I didn't know what that meant. Well, you don't, because eschatology is a wide uh, place of ideas about how it's going to end. So we don't agree. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. And different yeah. groups have a lot of different ideas about this. And syntax is it's the words we use to describe the, it, right? The kingdom is well, here. You, you know you're not talking about thousands of years. So let me give you an example since we've gone completely off the rails, yeah, off the rails. from whatever we're going to do. It's official. So yesterday I, I see this news report, and, and which is bothersome, that some kids at one of our local public schools protested while they were at school. They, did you see this? Huh. So they pulled the fire alarm, and they they all got out of Walked out of class. They they were in school, and the somebody the kid pulled. It's a plan. It's a coup. Yep. So they go outside and start Jericho style marching around the school. So I that that got my attention because I saw local. It is local. Okay. Yes, a heard. local public school. I looked it up to validate this, and so come to find out, the uh, school board declared that no longer would they allow cell phones at the school. You'll like this story, Phil. Or hoodies. No hoodies, no cell phones. So what's a hoodie? A mask? <laughs> I, I, I think a hoodie is like a sweatshirt that has a hood on it. 
That's correct. It's so funny that we have <laughs> the, word, the three I words for say, today, eschatology. Got, <laughs> we have eschatology, <laughs> syntax, and now hoodie. Hoodie. <laughs> 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 See, I'm not alone. Y'all been ripping me for using words. I mean, yeah. I mean okay. We, we, I'm just asking so, for grace, guys. On this I podcast, grace. They're, marching, they're marching. We literally go cell phones. We literally go from one extreme <laughs> to the other. So yeah, they're marching around. So the the, the reason I'm telling this story is because because that kind of made me angry. I'm like, so they finally do something, but then so they they. Try to contact the principal, and they're like, "Well, we'll we'll have we'll hear we hear you, and we'll have a conversation. We're going to talk to the kids." And so, the more I read this report, I had a sick feeling in my stomach. I'm the like, more the woke "School it, board man. said no, cell phone. not going to have a cell phone, which I think is a great idea. I do too. And I've, I assume the hoodie had to do something about concealing weapons or something while on, in school, so they can see what's you know underneath. And and so, but then instead of just saying that's the rule, our kids are protesting, which in my day would have resulted probably in a butt whooping when I got home. <laughs> it's like because they're questioning authority is why, why I bring this up. But when he said syntax, what's funny is the so the news gets wind of it, so they rush out there and start interviewing the kids. Oh boy, here's what stood out to me. And now I can say this with full confidence. You know what was embarrassing about this? In every interview, the syntax <laughs> or grammar used by these students was terrible. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I think you're making the point. You know why? Too many cell phones. They're you, watching the cell phone. You're on your cell phone. <laughs> Nobody used anywhere near correct uh, grammar. Yeah. In fact, I had to like read him three times to say, <laughs> "What? What did he just say?" <laughs> and I thought, "How embarrassing is it? This is going to wind up on the national news. I wouldn't be surprised if it did." It may, it may. And uh, so they, they want to overthrow the very educational system that. Well, maybe they need to overthrow well, it. It, they, it sounds they, like I mean, it's failing them. But maybe they yeah, need to. Overthrow. But they want to overthrow it because they won't let them bring their cell phones or wear a hoodie at the school. But I'm like, they they shouldn't bring a a, a cell phone, and, and, really and even that, it, it's the rules of the rule. They're, they're doing that because you're not learning anything. You're definitely not learning anything English in English. You need a new English teacher, because <laughs> I mean, it was like three for three, just a butcher of the in English language so much that I couldn't understand what they were saying. <laughs> Let's take our last well, break. Well, but but. Yeah, to be fair though, I mean, I've I've tried to read through uh, my own kids that the way they communicate on text messaging, I'm like, what are, what are all these acronyms? What is uh, there's one of them was called a SMH, shaking my head. I mean, I don't I don't know what they're talking about. You got to be like careful. Google. Usually they're they're uh, have cuss words in them. Because I remember oh, yeah. one time uh, I had five letters, and I asked my daughter what that was, and she's like, Dad, you don't want to know. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, is there a four-letter word involved in that? And she's like, yep. And I was like, and people, I see that all the time. Yeah. So she said, well, that's why they use letters. It's what happens when you remove God. You don't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. That's what happens. Maybe. Well, I was going to say, going back before y'all got off on the the terms that I used and uh, <laughs> the... <laughs> Where I, where I was going with the, Zach, this idea. There's 14 people in the world who have heard the word eschatology, and you're one of them, which is awesome. <laughs> I bet you there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast. I bet you there are. A lot, and if you if you know, if you know the word eschatology, you've heard it before. Please comment in the YouTube if you haven't ever heard of it. Don't say if anything. You get over a hundred people, on you, Zach. <laughs> don't you, right you lie now. about it out there because Revelation. You're going to get way more than say Zach uses two big words on the podcast. There's not a hundred people that are going to respond and say uh, and say I use the word eschatology at least once a year. Well, no, I no, say so you changed. You changed. You now changed the say, That's right. I, now we're yeah, Jace is changing so the parameters. Typical, that, that, that's a that's a typical Robertson move. You see what he did there? I, I, yeah. Do you know the word or do you use it once a year? I mean, that's not what we're asking. Have I you ever if heard we the just word stuck with the Scriptures that are all scriptures God breathed would probably be better off than any kind of ologies. 
Ology. Well, but you got well, we, but we well, we just use these terms ology. We all like th- even the scriptures we're reading are are I mean, these are translations of uh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we certainly believe in the Trinity. We use it that word or the, the the term triune God to describe things that are complex. We just reduce it down into something that's easier to say in certain circles. But and maybe it's not the best best terminology to use here. But I will say this though that the point that that I was trying to make is that your view of, of the kingdom, it does matter because if, you, if, if you're if you thinking that the kingdom is something that's way off and then that God's going to come back and he's going to set up this uh, new temple and this new thing, mm-hmm. I feel like you're kind of falling into the same trap of what Jesus is trying to get away from here, that like the temple is coming down. It's Precisely. coming down. Precisely. There's a new temple. There's a new, that's what, what did Jesus say? You destroyed this temple. I'm going to rebuild it in three days, t- talking about his own body. He's talking about his body. And so and, and, and then not just his body, John four, uh, 14 through John 17, he's telling us that, that the spirit's coming. And Paul says in First Corinthians six that there's another temple to where God lives now. In the Old Testament, it was it was in the tabernacle and in the temple that Solomon built. But there's a there's a new temple that's coming. And, and, and Paul, the apostle, says that that we are the temple uh, whom the Holy Spirit lives in, which is why sexual immorality is uh, is the the one sin a man commit, commits against his body. He says, "Don't you know that your bodies are uh, are, are, the, are house the Holy Spirit?" And so, I, I think that's why it matters it, to all of this is because the, the 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 linear progression of time of what's going on here with the the Jewish nation they thought they thought Jesus was going to come back or the Messiah was going to come back. He's going to set up an earthly kingdom. It's going to be a political kingdom. And they're going to regain power or they're going to have power and they're going to be kind of the, 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 the big dog power in the world. And um, and then Jesus is like, I'm, uh, he said he died. I mean, he, the, he was crucified. Uh, he was you know, spat upon. He was beaten, you know, just for, it, into a pulp. And you're like, man, that doesn't look like the kingdom that I thought was coming. But the kingdom that's coming if is they had one that their way, Zach, it would have uh, called out Gentiles like us. It would have called us out, which is what he says in in, in Mark three is yep. that is that there's the mystery, right? What's the the mystery yep. is the inclusion of the Gentiles. We know that from Ephesians. Uh, said, it's, 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 well, he started it's our off inclusion, saying, saying the kingdom of God is near, and I'm saying well, here we are in chapter four, in the first verse of. <clears throat> well, here we are in chapter four, and verse twenty six says, "This is what the kingdom of God is like: a man scatters seed on the ground." Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soul produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Well, a lot of people, they're immediately going to a futuristic view of whatever that means. Right. But then when you read the next one, look, again he said, what shall we say? The kingdom of God is like, uh, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed when you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. So people debate about that. So that's why I read chapter 9 and verse 1. When he eventually gets to his point <clears throat> that, oh, I didn't come here to heal all of your specific needs, even though I just did. Came here that you would come to me and crucify yourself and take your cross and follow me. He's then, preparing then he says, them, some of you standing here will not taste death before you see the kingdom of God. Come well, I would think that the kingdom he's describing, whatever these qualities are that we're reading on these parables, had something to do with how the kingdom operates here on earth in that setting. If you put connect those dots, of well, Mark one, Mark four and five, and there's others, and Mark nine one. You can't we can't form too many opinions on the kingdom of God if and until it's eight chapters in the book of Mark, before the bedrock of the kingdom is finally letting the the world know. He then, that's coming up in in Mark 8, he went through eight chapters 
to show who Jesus is, who he is, who he is, where he came from, what he's doing. But the gospel has not been announced. So remember, the beginning of the gospel is what Mark says. Well, it doesn't get there to chapter well, 8, verse 31 and following. Yeah. And um, with, with Matthew, it's 16 chapters before this is. But once he begins to announce what I'm going to do, I'm going to die, be buried and raised, then it begins to clear up on all this weight of the sins of the world are put on one individual and it's going to come through his death on a cross. And, and well, that's and true. That, that, that's the mystery that was hidden for ages. The one who would come and do that. Yeah, so, but in John, like John chapter two, he meant when he talked cleared out the temple, he immediately referenced that reference. I mean, it was pretty quick. But you got to think though, Judge John was only the last week or so of Jesus' life. That's so right. I, John I agree. picks it up at a later. That's I right. I agree. But my point is. You know, Jesus is him, him being when he said the time has come. Well, he he if if you just tried to get his death, burial, and resurrection away from that, well, he'd have said the time has come. But then he said, you know, it's finished. I mean, he he I realize he came here to die, be buried, and raised. But I'm saying don't minimize the life he lived. Before that, I mean, I, he's showing you, you what it's like. Take, well, yeah, I, I, I think it's invaluable. But, yeah. see, but to Dad's point, I agree that he's describing to these folks what the kingdom of God is like, getting them ready to then tell them what the kingdom of God is. Yeah, that's correct. To then prepare them what the kingdom of God comes. Yep. So I, I think you're right, and that it's not a waiting period. I you got to remember when he first announced it in the Book of Mark, which we'll get there. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside. And began to rebuke him. Even his apostles were saying, you're going to do, I, no way, you're, you're not going to die. And that was to Zach's point because they only saw it as an earthly kingdom. I That's agree. it. Uh, well, we're out of time. And so uh, mm. we, we got a little bit more to say about this in overtime before we get on to the next miracle. But Because uh, we didn't really flesh out those two parables, Jace Red. So let's do that during the overtime. You that, that's, because, that, that's, uh, because Jace sidetracked us with his uh <laughs> <laughs> with his, his critique of me. your literary, your language <laughs> skills. I only said what other people were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Look, here's what happens, Zach. People, when you were, said the word eschatology, a certain number of fingers went toward <laughs> the stop button on their device. And then they heard me say, what in the world is eschatology? And then, their finger... and then the finger went back to the steering wheel and they kept driving. Uh, well, Zach, we'll let you rebut that in the overtime. BlazeTV.com slash unashamed if you want to follow us over. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at BlazeTV.com slash unashamed.